Oh, my name is John Longstaff. In Stockton I was born. On a cold October morning, my eyes first saw the dawn. My granddad was a sailor, he wore the jacket blue. And when I found his old sea chest, I thought I'd be one too. Now when I was ten, the slump began, and I did not know why. My belly should be empty, my lips should be dry. There were jam jars for cups and there were newspapers for plates. And all us kids are waiting outside the factory gates. And it's Mr, 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 we said. Mr, 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 we bled. Mr, Mr, we sang like the dead. Mr, oh Mr, can you spare any bread? Now one day we pinched two duck eggs from a shop on Norton Road. And we ran back to Willie's house to cook our little lord. But Willie's mam, she were so poor, she never had a pan. So we threw him in the kettle, boys, and soon it boiled and sang. But two rosers traced us, they searched the old house through. They found the pantry empty and all our stomachs too. Says Willie's mam, would you like some tea? The kettle's on the job. Well, those rosers smiled and gave a wink. And they left her to Bob. And it's Mr, 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 we said. Mr, 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 we bled. Mr, Mr, we sang like the dead. Mr, oh Mr, can you spare any bread? Now when I left school at 14, I found myself a job. Twelve hours a day in the rolling mill, I toiled for my eight bob. With the furnace men, the roller and the heaver over man. And the scars from those sharp edge springs have still got on my hands. But one day misfortune took the heel off me clog. And down upon the black hot steel I fell like a dog. There were burns on me back and hands I couldn't carry on. And when I left the hospital I found my job had gone. And it's Mr, 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 we said. Mr. 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 We bled. Mr. Mr. We sang like the dead. Mr. Oh, Mr. Can you spare any bread? Out of work in 34 and too young for the dole. Buried under ashes like a lump of idle coal. There were men marching to London, sewing with them I slung. But when I said I was 15, they said I was too young. So secretly I stalked them at a slower rate. Through Darlington, North Allerton, first can had a gate. And when we reached the town of Leeds and they found out me plan, they said that I could march with them. For now, I was a man. again at the end as well and a little chat in between about the brilliant show that they've got coming to here the northern stage welcome to the launch for the spring season i'm alfie joy from bbc newcastle uh, if you are a bit younger i'm stephen karen from metro radio <laughs> Hello, thank you very much for uh, asking me to join together all the bits and pieces you're going to see tonight and I'll be explaining how to get a bargain for some of the great shows and um, we're going to hear from lots of people, lots of cast members, lots of directors, all the creative minds that put everything together. You're going to hear from Lorne in just a second, our director and our uh, company director who's got some news about his future but also his imminent future and what he's going to be directing here. Mick Fair, feel welcome by the way, who's our signer tonight. Thank you, Fair, Fair Alvey. And it is special. This is the 50th anniversary, believe it or not, of the Northern Stage. So there are some, I mean, the bar's always up here when you, you lay out your stall for a new season. But believe me, this is extra special. So there's a number of exciting events that will be announced throughout the year. So keep your eyes peeled, keep looking at your brochures, keep checking your emails, because you are the people who get first dabs to a lot of what's on offer. So as for tonight, you're going to get those special highlights. You're going to get um, an amused boosh. Oh, I know. You're thinking I should be on Radio 4 now, aren't you? 
I had to look it up just to check it was right. But yeah, you're going to get a little taste of some of the special treats uh, that are in store for you in the new season. And also, if you go to box office on your way out, not only can you buy tickets for the upcoming season, you can get 20% off many of the shows that you're going to hear about tonight. New members? Any new members in? There she is. <laughs> you can go and see everything for free. I've said that. No. I know there are others out there. You're all very welcome. And everybody else, the, the hearty, faithful, thank you very much for keep coming back and supporting this brilliant, brilliant venue. Give yourselves a round of applause for what you do to keep this place going. And as I say, box office is open tonight, right after the show. So dash out there and uh, fit your boots and grab your bargains. So please welcome from there to here, Lauren Campbell, Northern Stages Artistic Director and Joint Chief Executive to the stage. My mic's gone off. My mic's gone off. I'm a projector. <laughs> I'm a presenter. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 They'll get me a stick mic. I'll present oh, sorry. it. You, you can share mine. I'll share yours. Let's get into it, Lawn. There we are. So, a big year, 50 Lawn. Yeah, it's hugely exciting. And as you say, you know, whenever you're putting together a season of work. Oh. So that was quick. So I didn't even yeah. see who was behind yeah. me there. Well, you, you it's like, he should be on Ninja Warrior. Yeah, that yeah, was man. great. That's, that's the magic of theatre. If you wear black on stage, no one Nobody can notices. see you. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, uh, as always, you know, any the season... The Invisible Man <laughs> is coming, actually. That's yeah, yeah, uh, one of the shows. On, yeah, yeah. It's all very subtle marketing, you see. Um, so yeah, we putting together a 50th year is a really exciting thing to try and do because you want to pay homage, respect to everything that's come before, but really, more than anything else, we wanted to look at where we are now and towards the, the future, asking ourselves that big question of, of what comes next. So, in our own work, um, we really wanted to think about how the world feels to us now. And as we all ask ourselves that question of, like, what, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? And as that idea began to evolve, it became more and more about hope. Um, and about hope being, hope really feeling like a radical political act at the moment, about going, I do hope, I do believe in a better world, and I do believe that I can play a part in that. And so as we started to look at work that was coming through commissioning, about work we were making with our partners, that's become a real spine of the, the, the year, not just in the work that we're putting on stage, but in the way we're working with our young company, in the way that we're working in Biker, in the way that we're working with our members, all of that. So I think if there's a line that goes right through the year, that's it. And I hope. think there's something, yeah. yeah hope. And, and within that and from that comes a gala performance. Yeah, so I don't normally speak with notes, but there's so much going on that I thought I should write, a, write a few things down. So as well as the programme that we're going to be talking about through the evening, there's going to be uh, a new um, show from our young company. There's going to be a, a summer family fun day, which will be announced the date of that later on. Against one of the autumn performances, there's going to be a special gala. We'll talk about the date of that later. Um, we're working with a, a wonderful filmmaker from um, North um, from Northumberland called Chris Deegan, who's working with a, a brilliant group of young people who are making a documentary all the way through the year about the history of Northern Stage and about where we've come from, where we are now. So I'm sure during that, many of you will actually end up being in interviewed. So there will be a, a, a really interesting process that we'll go through with that, as well as all of the work on stage. And also, um, sadly, for a lot of people, um, I'm sure for you as well, Lauren, you're moving on to pastures new. Seven years you've been here? Yeah, so it'll be seven years by the time I go. Um, and yeah, I'm heading off to, to Cardiff to take up a new role as Artistic Director of National Theatre Wales. Um, and it's that funny yes, double turn. Yes, <laughs> I think so. Oh, you. Yes, um, oh, you. Um, and it, yeah, it's that, it's that weird two sides of a coin where you're really sad to leave and very excited to, to go and see what's coming next. You know, the, these jobs are remarkable. This is such a, such a beautiful theatre, such a beautiful city and, and region to run a theatre in that, you know, you, you pinch yourself all the time of going, <laughs> can you believe what my job is? <laughs> they've, they've given me a whole building to make stuff up in. Um, <laughs> like one of the, uh, this building has many wonderful and not so wonderful architectural foibles to it. Um, one of the little oddities of the building is that you can't get from the bar to 
the administrative side of the building without coming through this room, which um, you can imagine the architect going, I mean, it's going to be very inspiring. You'll pass through the theater space. It will constantly remind you that you're in a creative world. And it does do that, which is amazing. It also means that when there's a show on, it's a very long walk uh, to get from one place to the other. But throughout my time, it's been, you know, this is such a remarkable room. And on a daily basis, walking through it and seeing this, this space for imagining for a, a community, for a society to dream and imagine itself better is a, a thing which I'm really, really going to miss. Mm -hmm. um, and that rooting of of being in a building, building relationships with audiences over time. Absolutely. So that's that's it. it's sad, but it's brilliant. It's great to see this as part of your your legacy. And what will you remember? I mean, I don't want to to sort of uh, put you on the spot, but one or two highlights from your time here that you think even when you you're old and grey, <laughs> you'll you'll always remember. I think um, you know when you when you come to work at a building, you're the first thought is about what are we going to put on? What are we going to put on stage? What are we going to make? And of course, those those milestones punctuate the time you've had. You know, all the shows we've taken up to Edinburgh, Catch Twenty Two, the first big show that we made when I when I got here, all the Christmas shows, uh, Last Ship, of course, that whole experience of of that. But I think if there are a couple of things that will really stay with me more than anything else, it's um, I think the formation of Young Company. And what that's meant for us as an organization, that it was a, when I arrived, I was had this really clear idea that we had to try and find ways to make the building more porous, more accessible to more people. And that if there's one useful thing you can do when you have a little bit of power, a little bit of control, is to give it away all the time in as many different ways as you can. And it was a real journey to get to a place where we were ready to, to begin Young Company. And then over the last couple of years, watching the tentative first steps of hand and control of, of the work that's made in this building over to these inspiring groups of young people, to the bit where they've started treating it like their front room is incredibly exciting when it stops being an exciting thing of, oh, look where I'm allowed to, of course, of course I should be able to do this. Of course I should be able to talk about the things that I want to in the ways I want to. So I think that's one big thing. And then the other thing is really about, is about audiences. That more people are coming to this building now than have ever come before. They come from further afield. They come from, from different parts of, of our society. And that broadening, which of course still has a long, long way to go. And I hope you know, the building carries on with, with that after I've left. And you know, I think it's sort of embodied in we now have 600 members um, who feel really close to this organization. And it's yes, it's about buying tickets, but it's also about being connected to things like the work in Biker, about things like the work with Young Company. And we're now rolling out a new evolution of that member scheme, which is all about finding new ways to allow that closeness to happen so that when you support us, and we do need your support in all sorts of ways, of course financial, but also social and emotional and cultural and political and all of those things. So please watch out for that new program coming out. You'll be getting lots of information about it. And it's all about how can we grow closer to you? How can you grow closer to us? And particularly those, those bits of work which are really about our, our social mission and how that fits into the, to the broad program of work. And, and to the end of your tenure, you're keeping your hand in. You've got one final swan song, and it involves the three chaps who will invite back up to the centre stage. Give them a round of applause again. <laughs> We've got Sean, Michael, and David. And tell me about the, the ballad of, of Johnny Longstaff. So, um, in the roundabout way, nothing ever goes in a straight line in theatre. Um, so, last year, I was in Toronto. We were, we were taking the last ship to Toronto. And uh, this brilliant artistic director of the Harbour Front Centre, which is sort of a bit like the Barbican, but in Toronto, came to see the show, really loved it, and went, you must know the youngins, they're this amazing band from Stockton. <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> um, um, and Mara gave me this amazing album to listen to, The Ballad of Johnny Longstaff, which tells this remarkable story. And they'd seen the guys perform it and thought that there might be an interesting way of, of making a theatrical version of that. So when I came back, we met, we started talking, and we haven't stopped talking since. It's been and then a week later, you said you were boogering off to Wales. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy. What a guy. Not, nothing personal. <laughs>
<laughs> you might get another gig out of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Tour. Yeah. And, and, and it's your Welsh accent. The Welsh version. <laughs> um, the Ballad so of Taffy Longstaff. <laughs> it's going to be great. There you go. And, and chaps, you tell me about um, how you came across this, this folk hero in, from where you're from. Uh, yeah, in, in, a, in a beautiful way, really. Um, five years ago, we were doing a show down in Somerset, a, a normal gig for us, and a man approached us at the end of the show carrying a picture, a picture of a scruffy-looking teenager from the 1930s with a flat cap and a cheeky grin, and he said, that's me dad. And he had this other piece of paper in his pocket, a list of information, dates, some of the most defining moments of working-class history in the early 20th century, and he said, and that's what my dad did. There you go. You can have him. <laughs> Hoping that we might be persuaded to write a song about his dad. But these several years later, and we haven't just got one song, we've written 17 songs in a whole show. I'm delighted to tell you that that man, Johnny's son, Duncan Longstaff's with us here tonight. So welcome, Duncan. Yeah, over <laughs> there. So it, 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 it's felt really precious to us from, from the very beginning and Duncan and the family have, have bombarded us with information, with stories about Johnny. We had access to Johnny's very own collection of, of books about the things that, uh, accounting the, the, the places that he was in the 1930s. This is, you know, Johnny went on the hunger march of 1934. He walked all the way from Stockton to London when he was 15 years old. Um, when he was 17, he lied about his age and was smuggled off to fight against fascism in the Spanish Civil War. But the most remarkable thing, I think, for us, and the precious thing, really, is that we don't just have Johnny's story, we have Johnny's voice, because before he died, he recorded his story in his own words, and that's a big part of the show, is Johnny's own Teesside voice telling the story, and the songs weaving in and out of it, but also some remarkable animations as well. Sounds fantastic, mm -hmm. and and as much as you've you've already sort of put this together, this is a, a tweaked version, a newer version, a fresh version. Yeah. So we, when we start talking about how do we take this from being a you know a theatrical gig into a piece of theatre, um, we start thinking about how might you stage it, and then um, I introduced the guys to a, a, an amazing visual artist and theatre maker from also from Stockton uh, called Scott Turnbull. Um, and then we've been working to sort of make a, a world of uh, animation that sort of forms a landscape around the show. So it's everything like there are some, some very poetic, beautiful songs, and we've sort of worked a lot with landscape and, and light and colour and composition. And then there are uh, some very funny songs where we've done some silly stuff with uh, puppets on sticks. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's sort of, it's like, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely movement, and it's sort of, the song cycle, the music and the storytelling and Johnny's voice is already such a powerful theatrical thing. So it's felt like the job has just been to find a way to, to frame it and to introduce a new audience to it, you know, a theatre audience who might not go to a folk gig, but also hopefully to introduce a lot of folk fans who might not normally come to a theatre and see how we can join that thing together. And then we do it here, we take it on tour around the UK, and then next autumn it'll go off to Canada um, and begin a longer international life mm. as well. Brilliant. Ladies and gentlemen, the young'uns, that's when it's on for now, Lorne, and the young'uns will see you at the end. Thank you very much. This is uh, my, my chat show boudoir here, so um, I'm going to be um, inviting people over here. It's a bit like the This Is Your Life set, isn't it? But it'll be the This Is Your Show set. Um, so first up, we've got Amy Golding, director of Northern Stage and Curious Monkey's new production of Here to, to the... Chacho Boudoir, thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> so tell us about Here, it's, quite, it's, a, it's a title with some impact, isn't it? Um, yes, so the play is, it's essentially a story about a girl who disappears, um, and it's set here uh, now, so it's set in Newcastle, um, in Biker, uh, and it's um, in a library, a struggling library that's kind of facing closing down, um, and it's about all the people that use that library from Biker, so the local community, including people who have come to Biker from all over the world. So there's lots of characters from, um, from Kurdistan, from Albania, from Angola, uh, as well as a, a brilliant, hilarious librarian who's a Geordie Scottish, uh, um, brilliant character played by Karen Trainer, who we all know and love here. Um, yeah, so the story's kind of about... Um, 
It's about the unusual friendships that the librarian makes with the different people from, um, from the different communities and about this friendship between two girls, uh, two teenage girls, Pauline and Lulia. One's from Angola, one's from Albania, and they, they really want to go and do something extraordinary. Mm. Um, a lot of it's about books, of course, because it's set in a library. So it's about the power of books and stories. Um, and if you love reading and words and poetry, then you're going to love it. And also, if you just love a good story, you're also going to love it. And it's part of the Arriving Project. Just tell us a little bit more about that. Um, so we've been working over the past 18 months with um, people who are seeking sanctuary here in, in Newcastle Gateshead. So we're a theatre company of sanctuary, which means we work with people who um, are here as refugee and asylum seekers. So we've been working with lots of people who've been involved in helping us to develop the show. Um, for everything from being involved in the research to learning about set design and lighting design and AV. Do um, any of them ever perform? Um, well, on two of the nights when the show, the show's going to be on in stage two, and on two of the nights there's going to be a curtain raiser. So some of that group have decided to, to get together well. to make a piece. So they're going to be, form, be performing a, a, a curtain raiser. But three of the actors are, um, are, are professional actors, but from refugee backgrounds mm. as well. Brilliant. And, and you two of this after you've been here? We certainly do, yeah. We're, we're here uh, in March, um, and then we're going to be touring in April and June to various theatres um, across the North and the Midlands. Um, but yeah, it's a really... The show's really funny, mm. it's really heartwarming, and it's got a little bit of magic. Um, it, there's a kind of magic that comes out of the books, so yeah, and, hopefully and you'll love it. there's a certain magic about Biker. Um, I, I go across there as often as I can to do stories for BBC Newcastle. I absolutely love it. Just explain the connection between this building and what happens over in Biker. There's a great rehearsal space there. Yeah, absolutely. So Northern Stages rehearsal space is in Raby Street in, in Biker, so we'll be rehearsing that play there, which is fantastic because we're going to be... In, in the locality as we're rehearsing a play that's, that's set there. Uh, but Northern Stage has a real strong connection now with Biker, as does Curious Monkey, um, working within the communities there in Biker Community Centre um, and really building up a kind of a strong relationship um, with lots of people from all, over, from all over Biker. Brilliant, Amy. We look forward to it. So it's here. And that's when it's oh. here, on Thursday the 19th to Saturday I've the I've never seen it that big. It looks great. <laughs> Thank you. Let's hear for Amy. Thank you. Come and see here. So as well as uh, here, as well as Johnny Longstaff, Northern Stage, there's lots of great drama heading here um, in spring. I think we're alone, as you'll see in just a second. It's a new show from the critically acclaimed Frantic Assembly. The show is a delicate, uplifting play about our need for love and for forgiveness. It's written by the brilliant Sally Abbott, who's written Vera, The Coroner, and co-directed by Scott Graham and the tremendous Kathy Burke, inspirational comedian, <laughs> actress you'll know from Gimme Gimme, you'll know from Harry Enfield, and you might also know that, or you might not know, that she's done some great theatre work as well, director productions like Lady Windermere is found, The God of Hell, so that is absolutely, you know, to die for. That's, I think we're alone. And this is a little taster of the talented Mr. Ripley.
it's a it's a complex character. It's a it's a psychological drama. It's a thriller. It's got a lot uh, in it. I'm sure you might be aware of the film, but definitely, definitely, if you haven't seen it, try and catch that. Uh, next up, from from sort of a psychological thriller to something a little bit lighter, but from the creator of Peter Pan, Jane Barry. Um, this is almost a lost masterpiece. This is Quality Street. And yes, it is where we, you might be eating a tin of these left over from Christmas. But the name did come from this very play. And it is, as I say, a forgotten masterpiece, but it's a delicious farce by the Peter Pan writer. And it tells the story of Phoebe Throssell, who takes on an alter ego to rekindle a relationship, basically, when she was dumped to get back. So there's a lot going on there in way of a farce. Later this season, there's another new Northern Stage co-production in the shape of Shandyland. And this is the story of life, love, death and booze. Sounds like a night at the big market. <laughs> Let's find out more from Hannah Bannister, director of Shandyland. Thank you, Hannah. I love that picture. Um, so, I took that. Hannah, what, did you take that? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Uh, <laughs> just tell me, what, what can you tell us about this, this new show, Shandyland? Well, it, set, it starts in 1995, and we see the birth of Amy, and she's born into a pub and into a community. So we watch her grow, and we watch the pub decline, and they're kind of both the lead character in the story. And it's the community and the lives of the community within that pub and it's sort of about when Gareth first started talking to me about the play that he wanted to write and the, the importance of pubs as a cultural hub and the tragedy of them closing up and down the country at the extent that they are, which I believe is about 27 a week, predominantly in working class communities as well, and that they're so important for conversation. So that's where we've come at with the production and what we are getting towards, which is really fun are these incredible, exquisite conversations, which mm. are hilarious and sort of dangerous, and um, they just have it all out, really, which is, I think, it's beauty and kind of what makes the pub exceptional. There's some conversations you can only have in the pub, and there's something about your consciousness being altered when you've had a drink and everybody can finally connect with each other. So it's also about connection and disconnection and misconnection, I would say, uh, which follows a kind of family drama at its heart and how the pub feeds into that and it's the tragedy of them not being as around as they mm. were, really. I'm, I'm captivated because I was born in a pub or a club, so <laughs> this is like my life. Um, <laughs> but it's not about me, it's about you and your yeah. show. It spans 20 years, this. Yes. So how do you dramatise that? Uh, what sort of decisions are you making about how it's going to play out? Yeah, it's epic. It is epic and it's fun. You sort of duck in and out of um, the life of Amy and the life of the pub. So I think we start in 1995, 1996, 2001. Beckham's free kick, that's in there. <laughs> and uh, then it's 2008, so smoking ban and all of the financial crisis. And then we hit sort of 2013, right up to 2016, and you've got Brexit in the background, but it's definitely not a Brexit play. 100% <laughs> not that. Well, that's the thing about pubs. They're, they're funny, but they're sad. Yeah. And they're, they're raucous, uh, but they're quiet, and they can be intense. Yeah. There's so much going on all at the same time. Yes, and it's definitely a celebration of all of that. Like, you've got karaoke in there. There's um, cock jokes and piss. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> at the same time, Oz. it's... <laughs> but it's also... I think that the audience will be able to connect to the sadness of the human collateral that's kind of left floating when you shut down these yeah. conversations. And it, it, it does feed into where we are politically now with people that aren't heard anymore. And where does, where does your like, work-a-day alcoholic go that is there propping up the bar every single... We know them, like there are people. We all know these people, we all know this pub. And, and it's, it's their story too. So you should see yourselves in it. You should see people you know, people you love, people you hate and it, it just has it all out. And you see both sides of the argument, and it's a really non-judgmental look at working-class life. And that's what I think is really special about it, because mm. there aren't loads of them around, and that's what's special about this place as well. I think. Tiny bit of good news. Uh, the, we did a story on the radio <coughs> last week about the slight 
comeback of the pub. It is slight, but oh f- for the first time, the figures are reversed last week. And uh, I think there's a couple of pubs reopened in Jarrah in the northeast and just one or two, you know, booking the trend. So fingers crossed. That's, that's hope that you're that we're talking about. Yeah. It's all about hope. You see, you hope, see, hope, guys. it's all connected. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's Thank hear you. it for Shandyland. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I did say I would pepper throughout my bits, um, little bargain. So Johnny Longstaff, I think we're alone. Talented Mr. Ripley, Quality Street, Shandyland. They're all part of a little bargain. If you go and see three or five of them and you book now, you get a, a special deal for three or five of the shows. So get yourself to the box office once you leave. Box office will be open and they'll tell you more. Now, we did say Brexit won't be mentioned. It might be now. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a party political broadcast from the Mimicry Party. All oh, right, yes. Uh, yes. All right. All right. Yes. Uh, yes. Coming to Jordy Land to do the launch of the new season at the Northern Stage. I uh, can't wait. We're going to be there with you, Northerners. Uh, are Jordy's Northerners? Yes. Uh, how can you be Jordy's and Northerners? Yes. We're coming to you. We can't wait. Uh, get your t-shirts off because I know you like to go bare chested uh, whenever you're, yeah, you're out and about because you're hard as nails, aren't you? Geordies, we love you. Yes, we do. We're coming. We can't wait. Uh, we have lots of fun. It's going to be serious too. Uh, uh, yes, Brexit. Brilliant. Fantastic. Did, did they go for Brexit? Oh, I can't remember. Uh, I've never I've been to Newcastle. At least you're not Liverpudlians, Scousers. Oh, uh, no, you're much better than them. I know you like me saying that. Yeah, Newcastle. Way a man. Come on, bring it on. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, bite the groove, eh? Oh. That's it. Is that right? Get off now. Hey, there it is. The last temptation of Boris Johnson. If that's not funny, I'll pay for the Big Ben bongs myself. <laughs> that looks great. And what's brilliant about that is it's going to change. There's, it's promised to be so up to date that it will reflect whatever's happened that week, maybe even that day. So whichever show you see, it'll be bespoke, it'll be up to date, it'll be topical, and it's not for the doomsters and the gloomsters. So there you are, the, the last temptation of Boris Johnson. And from that damned Prime Minister to that damned woman, as we hear from the cast of Headlong Theatre's new show, Faustus, That Damned Woman. The play is about a woman called Johanna Faustus. She was born in the 1600s. The devil offers her opportunity. We see this woman try to, first of all, revenge her mother's death, but then use the opportunity that Lucifer has given her to try and beat him at his own game. Despite its darkness, it's very hopeful. It's about legacy. It's about living uh, in a fearless way and facing death. In terms of the rehearsal process, it's been very exciting. I have a really wonderful company of actors that I'm working with. The creative team as well are really enhancing the world of the play. It's a very collaborative ensemble-led piece. Jodie McNee's performance as Johanna Faustus is extraordinary. The writing is incredible and I think the themes of it are really unique. The world that is being created is entirely its own and hopefully it'll be a very unique experience for the audience that they won't have seen anything like it before. I'm speaking from the roof of the Broadcasting Building, New York City. The bells you can hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. In the last two hours, three million people have moved along the roads to the north. Hutchinson River Parkway still kept open for traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island hopelessly jammed. Communication with Jersey Shore closed ten minutes ago. No more defenses left. Our army wiped out. Artillery. Air Force, everything wiped out. This may be the last broadcast. I'll stay here till the end. People are holding a service below us in the cathedral. Streets are all jammed. Enemy now in sight above the palisades. Five, five great machines. The first machine is crossing the river. I can see it from here. It's wading the Hudson like a man wading through a brook. The first machine reaches the shore, it stands watching. 
Its steel, cowlish head, even with the skyscrapers, it waits for the others. They rise like a line of new towers on the city's west side. They lift their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running towards the East River, thousands of them. They're dropping in like rats. Smoke spreading faster and out to reach Times Square. People in the streets try and run away, but it's no use. They're falling like flies. That's great, Julie. Julian Spooner from Rum and Clay. Uh, thanks for that. That was brilliant. By the way, I beat you to it. I've already got my tickets for this. Honestly, my son is absolutely mesmerised at the minute by War of the Worlds. He's read the book. He's he's listened to the the Jeff Wayne and and we've just seen we've just watched together the TV adaptation, which is a bit different. You've got to do something different with this. Everyone who's tried it has to do something different. What are you going to do? Yeah, well, we've taken inspiration from Orson Welles's uh, version of it in 1938, and that's an extract uh, from uh, the, the the end of the broadcast. Um, and if you don't know about it, uh, Orson Welles uh, wrote it as a fake news bulletin. Uh, so a lot of people, as they were like surfing the the channels on their radios, uh, a lot of people missed the beginning because yeah. a lot of people were tuned into a ventriloquist act who was very <laughs> popular at the time. I don't know how ventriloquism works on the radio, but. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was the 30s, yeah. they didn't have much. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> I think they were surfing the radio and then suddenly a voice comes on and says, breaking news from Grover's Mill, the cylinders landed and there's an alien coming out. Ah! You know, and they did it very sort of realistically. And because it was the 30s, people were already sort of quite primed just before the Second World War. So there was a kind of... And a, he was a genius. And he was a the genius. The Mercury rep and the Royal Yeah, Group. yeah, absolutely. Orson Welles really peaked very soon. And he did Citizen Kate at 27. He's an absolute genius. So, so he kind of our show um, opens with all of us playing Orson Welles, telling us about his fantastic broadcast and how f wonderful mm -hmm. it was and how I fooled everyone because I'm a genius. <laughs> uh, and then the, the other strand of the uh, show is, is a narrative set in 2016 in the run-up to the US presidential elections just before Trump gets elected. Um, so we then set it in Grover's Mill, which is where Orson Welles' broadcast is set. Um, and Grover's Mill, I actually went to Grover's Mill in New Jersey, uh, and it's now famous because of the broadcast. So there's a park with a plaque say, saying the Martians landed here. And there's, a, there's an old water tower from the 30s, which apparently people shot at, because it looks like an alien <laughs> tripod. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, so the other part of our show is set in this town and a podcaster is making a podcast about a family who's been split apart because of the 1930s broadcast. And she's sort of unraveling the truth behind that story. Um, so then, it's, then it sort of becomes a story about fake news and misinformation and, and stories and mythology um, and how our own sort of personal histories and family histories and the anecdotes we tell ourselves can be also closely linked to fake news and misinformation and and why we why do we believe in clickbait and fake news and why do we want to believe uh, in in a good story I suppose and it's it's a, it's a kind of a, it's an examination of, of that really um, but it's also really funny as well it's yeah. very playful it's very visual it's very physical um, so yeah and so. Uh, would it be a spoiler alert to say how you do certain things certain conventions or uh, we sort of, so uh, we, we kind of, we stage a podcast on stage. So we thought about um, podcasts, it's, it's such a modern idea. phenomena, yeah. like what, and we try to physicalize how you hear a podcast. So one of the main characters is carrying around her Zoom recorder and it's sort of a multi-rolling show. So there's only four of us, but we play lots of different characters. And when she points her recorder uh, over, over in this direction, someone suddenly becomes a character, uh, you know, within the podcast world and then slips away again. So it's a very kind of like fluid sort of multi-rolling piece um, and uh, yeah it's a lot of a lot of multi-rolling a lot of comedy and it's uh, it's yeah it's got a, a really I think a fantastic story as well oh yeah yeah, Compliment as well. Your, your interpretation sounds fresh. Sounds yeah. brilliant. Good luck with it, Julian. Thanks Thank so you. much. I just don't know how I'm going to... Till June, I've got to keep my son yes. at bay. Because he's yeah, already... Yeah. He got it as his Christmas Day present. So oh, fantastic. So excited. I look forward to meeting Thank him. you very much. Thank you. Julian. There are lots of, lots of family shows uh, I could bring them to in the meantime. Let me tell you about some of those. Uh, the Pied Piper Theatre Company presents Dig, 
which is a great first theatre experience for the very young that brings to life a world of grown plants, busy bugs, wriggling worms. Uh, Northern Ballet, they return. I don't know if anyone saw uh, Puss in Boots or brought the kids to see Puss in Boots. This is the fairy tale Little Red Riding Hood. The fly is outside of some beautiful artwork. Do take one on the way out. The perfect opportunity for your little ones to enjoy live ballet, music and theatre all at the same time. You can enjoy thrilling, spectacular circus skills from the Lost in Translation Circus with their new show, Hotel Paradiso. Bamboozle Theatre Company present Moonsong, which is an enchanting, intimate production that's perfect, especially for audiences on the autistic spectrum. So it's very, very user-friendly for that. And the Lingo Theatre will be bringing two brilliant shows for the over threes, Jack and the Beanstalk and What a Wonderful World. So stacks of shows for all of the family. From family shows to dance shows, dance fans, you are spoilt for choice this spring. Leeds-based dance company Phoenix Dance Theatre are going to be bringing their new contemporary dance piece, Black Waters, to Northern Stage. Far From the Norm's vital and gripping Black Dog is a genre-defying blend of hip-hop, dance and free-form antics about an ageing artist who's trying to retain and hang on to their youth. Gateshead Dance Group Gateway Studio Project present Homegrown, which is an exciting variety of new dance work showcasing their hugely talented youth provision and their performing company. Northern Ballet, they return with three smashing, sensational short ballets. That's in April. And finally, there's going to be a brand new program from the world's most exhilarating early career dancers, Rambo 2. Now, if you are dance fans, I can't recommend highly enough. Get yourself a dance pass again. Ask at box office on the way out. There are discounts by Buchan as part of that Northern Stage dance pass. Now... Let's look at what our young company have to offer. Before we welcome our guests to the stage to chat about what's in store, let's look back at last year's smash hit show from the young company, Where Do We Belong? Whoever you are and wherever you're from, from the day you were born into thine kingdom come, How am I doing? Honestly? It's often the best policy. Those powerful women of old Hollywood. Male, female, fluid, gay, bi, straight, pan, transgender. One of these greens represents you. Brexit! Tearing this bloody great of yours apart. Oh, but i Shall we explore We are equal and we won't stop dancing. Welcome, Northern Stages Associate Director Louis Ingham and one of our young performers, Elizabeth. <laughs> Grab a mic. So that was exciting. That was called Where Do We Belong? And now we've got Where Do We Go Now? Which is a follow-up, a sequel? It's a follow-up sequel and it's the third of a trilogy and it's sort of a little bit because we genuinely don't know, both inside <laughs> the rehearsal room and outside of the rehearsal room. I think um, for anybody who saw Where Do We Stand, which was the first show we did, that kind of was um, a, a show that was kind of talked about confidence, about wh where people knew that they, they were in the North East and was inspired by their personal histories and Where Do We Belong looked at the lens through, through being European and what it meant for us. Um, and Where Do We Go Now is, is really about human narrative. Um, and the great thing about not knowing what show is that you, I can say anything and it could be anything by April. So book your tickets because what we do know is it'd be great. Um, but also <laughs> that it will, it, we're exploring 
truly what it means to be human and what that world's going to look like through the lens of, of this generation specifically. Um, and it's fair to say that as well as the hope that Lon describes, which I have the, the, the privilege to work with on a weekly basis, um, there's a lot to talk about and there are lots of different time bombs clicking and clocking. Um, we're talking about the planet, not the climate catastrophe show, but the, the character of the planet is definitely in here. Um, we're talking about money. Uh, and we're talking about um, biotechnology and disruptive technology and um, trying to work out how we square off all these different kind of things. But also, have we lost the narrative as a species? What a comedy that's going to be, folks, huh? <laughs> Amazing. Um, but it is, it's like really like it's a collaborative live written experience. It's co-creation in the room and, uh, and everyone sort of talks about what things, what things matter to them about, whether that's universal credit or zero hour contracts. Um, but we always, hopefully you got a, a flavour, it's always got kind of like a really like joyful act of resistance is how we describe it. It's not a show, people have heard me say this before, it's not a show where you go, we're all great, and you're all terrible. Mm. It's not that. It's a conversation to go, what do we do? Where do we go now? But also about what, what those new world orders, new world structures look like. It's made up from an incredible group of people, um, and uh, they're all from very different backgrounds, very different experiences, very different political beliefs, religious beliefs, cultures, ideas. Um, how, and how do they come to you? How, how do you... We just we manifest them, yeah. Um, they, um, we, we, we do a lot of um, workshops and taster sessions and we work a lot in partnerships, so we work a lot with, the, with our community partners in Biker, but also kind of spreading word of mouth about, it's really about who isn't represented both on stage and off stage, um, and that's through both our workforce and our, our technical and production teams, um, and why uh, our colleagues won the UK Theatre Award for Workforce Development, which is how, looking at how our work experience programme exists, and it's a tremendous testament. Uh, yes, yes! Yeah. Um, and why, why, and what does it add to the show? Putting it together in Biker, uh, I know what I think about it. You tell me. Well, the show that we, we've have got three different companies. So we have an, an ensemble who are performance based. We have um, a group, group called the Collective who are sort of new to to, th to theatre performance. On Wednesday, we have an amazing group called the Team, um, and we sort of start from position of cooking and telling stories and, and just sharing time together and, and and work together on the first year this year as a biker's best summer ever, which is a bold title, but it definitely lived up to it. Um, and um, it's. It's about conversation, mm. it really is, and it's about having fun together and sort of, you know, being in the real world, which I think is quite a challenge when, when you're up against Fortnite and all of those kind of worlds. Um, but, you, but being in a room together and, and connection, breathing together, playing together, laughing together, I've said far too much, but I am gonna, um, this is um, Elizabeth, who is one of our writers, this collectively written, <laughs> on cue. Uh, and um, uh, just to say as well, we, we said, oh, I said to Elizabeth on Monday, oh, do you fancy sharing a bit of something that you've written? It's really hard for writers to share things that they've only just written, and, 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 and she's very brilliant, they said that she's happy to do that. So um, and, uh, this is uh, the first sort of draft of something that may or may not, we don't know, uh, be in the work. So over to Elizabeth. The election. We all have different things to say, right? So I can speak only on behalf of myself when I say that I cried all night. I gripped my bed sheets till my knuckles hurt and remember thinking of the way I clung to mum's shirt when my dad died. Hearts torn open and left too wide. I can see him in my mind's eye. It's hard, love, but catch yourself on. It's always darkest before the dawn, and he was right. But I needed time to reel from the fright and fear. So, teary-eyed and terrified, I took a walk in the morning. Before my 12-hour shift, exhibition park through Talmur, and deadlifted the weight of this news from my shoulders as though 20-ton boulders were rolling down my back into the pavement, cracking it. I talked out loud to myself, and there was nobody there, just me in the grass. Just me and that mass of green fading to grey in the cycle of seasons, grievance. This is grievance. I howled at the frozen sun. I growled like a dog whose muzzle's come and done and is lashing out, stretching from restriction, going apeshit trying to find some new kind of different. Looking out to my city's great expanse of land, the middle distance, I hummed to myself songs of resistance and made a pact that persistence is power, and power's not all that bad when you're showered with madmen and ivory towers. Looking down to your long hours and minimum wages and pages and pages of bills and rent and money well spent on very little to eat, fainting when you go to meet your friend for a coffee because you paid for that cuppa rather than buying something for your supper because it was too embarrassing to admit that you couldn't pay both. Why should these leaders be ruling me or you? 
And I know it's wrong that I should feel sorry for myself too. At least I've got a job and a roof and a parent and a place to take a breather where people will listen. Look, I'm exhausted, but I'm not the only one christened in dirty water by this. Our election. This reflection of our great people. Is anyone waiting to be served? Back in the bar, I'm shouting because I won't be heard. I get home at 3 a.m. this time. Friday night, you see, drinkers are in their prime. I scrub the work from under my nails and sit frail on my quiet bed, picking at threads from raggy jeans and wondering if this is just a means to an end. And the inside of my shoe reads, made in England. I don't sleep. I sit thinking selfishly about how selfish I've been. Instead, I take the same walk, the same park, sniffling into my scarf and staring up at stars crowded by lonely fog lights, guiding lonely, freer cars that trundle past their bedtimes. The dense skyline yawns in rhythm with my chest. The same old skate park, hollowed, is in a deep sleep and doesn't move, so I tiptoe and sit by its feet in the same way that you watch your lovers before they wake, consuming love for them that they aren't there to take. I have been so selfish. If radical empathy is sweeping the nation, then let's be clear that this is a call to our action stations. I have fetishized this pain to indulge myself, and it gushes from my pores, but I can stop that. We can stop that. There are millions of me bleeding self-sympathy till we bleed out. And there is birdsong in the trees now. I've been here for hours, sat on the same bench, devouring the same thoughts and the same torrential dark. It is sunrise in Exhibition Park and I smile. It's going to take a while and the insulted injury won't heal in a day or a week or even these five years. But we can kick our boots up and start fighting while we hurt. Don't call yourself the good guy but see the good guy in your mind's eye and listen. Listen to the narratives of oppressor and oppressed, damned and blessed, depressed but well-dressed, hunter and hunted, killer and killed, protester and disruptor, elitist or unskilled, minimum wage workers, six-figure shirkers, pinstripe suits or metal toe cap boots, White men, with single parent responsibility, refugees forced to swim the turbulence of seven seas, trans kids terrified and crying in their sleep again because the body isn't right that their God has given them. It's not right to hear just one side of these debates and it isn't about what is failing to be great. It's what's failing to be fair. It's what's failing to be just. The only thing we need is a universal trust. Listen, listen. Listen all you can. This is not the fall. It is the beginning of man. I love how Lee said, we're not sure whether that bit's gonna make the cut. Incredible, that's how good it's gonna be. So just get a ticket on your way out. That was so exciting, exhilarating, poetic, everything, that was great. Just great to see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please welcome another one of our associate directors, Mark Calvert. So, uh, I haven't seen you since Snow Queen. Brilliant. Well Thank done. Thank you so much. And, uh, Appreciate that. And, I mean, you shouldn't have favourites, but uh, wow. Uh, Lauren I Wayne. Know, I know. I know. And I was, when I was watching, I was thinking of Lauren Wayne. It was, the, it was a fantastic leading she i've seen her since she was a little girl at all sorts of pantos and as she's grown up being in, a bit in vera but to see what she did in the snow queen unbelievable yeah, she's amazing. i think you know that is the thing about you know there's huge talent in the northeast and like that blew my head off and i think that you know i'm here to talk about talent development yeah and i think that is the thing that um it exists in like our region and uh, I think what we want to do as a, as a theatre is to like, show the rest of the country and then potentially the world that there is huge talent within our region, be it writers, actors, directors, creatives, sound designers, technicians, like it's all here and we need to find ways to support it, like utilise it, push it, sell it and provide it opportunities because I think sometimes because of where we sit in the country, they don't come, and so I think in that, we're trying to find ways to bring uh, via things like North, 
Uh, we have a, a, a program here called North, which tries to find uh, opportunities and networks for artists in a, in um, in the northeast to connect with uh, people from uh, organisations such as the RSC, National Theatre. Uh, we're talking to Audible, the um, audio drama company, about how we can connect uh, those guys uh, to our artists in the northeast to give them opportunity beyond uh, what we can currently provide them. And so that's where we are. We have yeah. a, a huge program here of that. And behind us is North Festival. I'm doing a lot of talking. Alfie. Carry I mean, on, like, carry I mean, on. Oh, this, this I'm going to be out of breath. This this is the story, isn't it? Because it's not just about sitting there and watching, you know, the big show here. It's about what feeds this and what happens beyond here. That's what's vital. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, the, the thing of, like, once you get here, it's about how you get here. And I think it's about how we support them getting here and support them in the right way so we can have, we have world-class talent. So, and that world-class talent should be on our stages. Yeah. So this, this festival, yeah. what will that showcase? How will that? Work and I will so this is more about finding space to bring organisations, like I've said, to the northeast to talk to artists. Because sometimes it's easy to have a conversation if you can put a name to a face. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to do through North Festival is bring all of the names and the faces to here, so they can see our faces and learn our names and know what we do and how we do it. And so that's going to happen in June, and uh, we're going to have. Uh, not Around to be 50 confused seconds. with Vault Festival. Oh, Vault That's Festival. A, there's yeah. another festival. So part of our program is about supporting um, uh, independent theatre companies, and we run a program called North Bespoke Company Support. It's pithy, I get that. Um, <laughs> and part of that is a year-round package of support about uh, business practice, strategy development, organisation development, uh, learning from the departments here. We also learn from them. And this year, our associate producer, Annie McCourt, has uh, taken can, has managed to find a space for four of our northeast companies to go to Vault Festival in London, which is underneath Waterloo, and it runs for a month. It's like sort of like Edinburgh Fringe, but underground and cooler. Mm. And uh, and so we have four companies going there that we, with Live and Arc and people across the region, have sort of supported in many ways. Uh, they're buying the bonnets with their show and she. Um, they're yeah, cool, yay. Um, they're Cirque Motif with the Art of Cuddling and other things. Uh, they're Melody Sprawl with Jenna not included. Uh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> uh, these are all good things. And suddenly, because of that, I've forgotten the last They are, one. though. They're great opportunities, aren't they? And yeah, that's, totally. That's, that's sometimes unsung, but it's, it's the vision that we were hearing from Lorn at the beginning of our presentation that he wants to leave. So let's bring him back. Lorn, come back. Join us. So we'll, we'll hear, we're going to hear a little exclusive uh, from, from Mark in just a short while, but if you, Lon, would take us through some of the other things that we, we're trying to get out as much sort of exclusive stuff as we can. We did mention, let's start with the Invisible Man who we, we mentioned earlier <laughs> on. There's, there's a, a crowbar link. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it was very elegant. <laughs> um, so Invisible Man uh, is part of uh, another part of the North programme where each year we make a small scale show which uh, begins in stage three and then goes out and tours across the region. Um, this year we're, uh, we're doing The Invisible Man. It's written by an incredible writer from, uh, adapted by an incredible writer from the Northeast called Phil Corriera, who bought a show, Hiem, here a couple of years ago that I think, uh, I think I saw Charlie Hardwick in the audience. She was in it. She was very good. Um, <laughs> uh, so that, uh, that's going to be brilliant. I've read a first draft of the script. It's very, very cool. And it's, it's that brilliant thing that Invisible Man's one of those stories where you're like, I've heard of Invisible Man. What happens in it? Oh, I don't know. There's a guy, you can't see him. Um, but it's, it's, it's an amazing story and yeah. he's done a really inventive, fresh take on it. So, yeah, that's going to uh, be great. Red Ellen? Uh, so Red Ellen, um, she, of all the things I'm sad about leaving, I'm so sad that I'm leaving before this show happens because I've been trying to get this show made pretty much since the first day I arrived. Um, this is a new play about Ellen Wilkinson, um, who I'm sure many of you know about. She was the socialist MP for Jarrow, who led the Jarrow Crusade. Um, she was hugely involved in trying to mobilize um, Britain to uh, fight against the rise of, rise of fascism, first in Spain and then opposing uh, Hitler in Germany. She was um, secretary for um, uh, air raid shelters during the Second World War in Churchill's war cabinet. Um, she uh, had a, an affair with Herbert Morrison and also with a very dangerous Russian spy called Otto Katz. So she lived this like quite 
unbelievable, remarkable life. And a huge number of people have never heard of her. You know, and it's one of those things, if she was a man, she'd be a household name mm. in, that, in that way. Um, so Caroline has written the most remarkable uh, play. I think Caroline Bird is one of the most exciting writers in Britain at the moment. She's written this epic, powerful political play, which again is about, about hope, about um, an individual looking at the world and going, well, that's not going to do. We're going to have to do something about that and feeling both the right and the obligation to stand up and do something about it. Mm. So, yeah, it's going to be very cool. Sounds great. Um, th this sounds more traditional, but I'm sure it's not. The, the Great Gatsby, um, I'm reminded of Mark's brilliant Christmas Carol production, the records of that in the music there, but what are you doing with that? So, Great Gatsby, this is a, a, a big partnership between um, so many partners on this show. This is one where I have to refer to my notes. So, it's us, Bristol Old Vic, English Touring Theatre, Royal and Durngate in Northampton, Oxford Playhouse, Lyric Hammersmith, and Birmingham Rep, all collaborating on a really exciting new version of Gatsby. It's going to be incredibly stylish. It's again, has got some really interesting. I mean, Gatsby is one of those interesting stories where you go, oh, Gatsby, it's so sexy, it's so interesting. Oh, it's really sad. Um, you know, it doesn't. It doesn't end well. No spoilers. <laughs> um, it's good. Yeah, it's, it's going to be. A, it's going to be a stunning piece of theatre. And I should also mention, if you are interested in going to Gatsby as members, as uh, supporters of Northern Stage, we're going to be doing a special gala event on the 16th uh, of October. Um, you'll be getting an email in the next couple of weeks about that. So if you're tempted to book for Batsky, just hold fire for a few days until we get in touch about this special event that we're going to be doing around Gatsby as well. Brilliant. And Kitchen Zoo are back. Kitchen Zoo, my best beloved Kitchen Zoo, are going to be making their uh, third Christmas show for us with the uh, fairly spectacular uh, title, The Hey Diddle Diddle, Diddle Travelling Cabaret, A Christmas Spectacular. Um, it trips off the tongue. Um, so for those of you who have already seen Kitchen Zoo's work, it's playful, it's inventive, it's an amazing first introduction to theatre for our youngest audiences. It goes in stage three. They've just done uh, Wolf, which was a, a, a runaway smash. So yeah, we'll all be looking forward to that as well. And we've got uh, an exclusive announcement. Who wants to... Oh, you're looking at each other. Oh, it's Who's all, going to make all it? Mark. We need a drum roll for this. Oh, yes, that'll do. Hope it'll be worth it. <laughs> um, so, uh, the 2020... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the exclusive. I uh, missed it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so this year, uh, at Christmas, we're going to bring uh, a new version um, of The Sorcerer's Apprentice, um, which some of you may know um, from the Disney cartoon. Uh, Mickey gets accosted by buckets and soap and brooms and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, Laurel Lindell, who wrote uh, The Snow Queen, <laughs> yes, please, um, is going to... Uh, uh, put pen to paper and write us another smashing Christmas show. Uh, it's going to be packed full of music, movement, imagination, uh, and all the things that... Uh, you do it every year, lush, lavish, to. spectacular. And i say one more thing, I missed off a company in the Vault Festival, which is the brilliant You're Funny with their show, Minged Unhinged. So <laughs> <laughs> How did you forget that? I don't know. <laughs> brilliant. Well, thanks very much. Let's hear it once more for Lorne and... For Mark, you stay there if you want. You don't need to go back. Uh, singing us out, friends, are the young'uns. Let's welcome them back. We know we're going to enjoy this. There's a song sang upon the mountain And there's a song upon the sea There's a song sang in unison And a song in harmony And there's a song sang in every tomra and in 47 tongues 30,000 voices are all singing our song And the more of us who learn to sing it then The sooner there will be Peace beneath the branches of the lime and olive tree From mine and mill and field and shipyard From behind the company door from the plain fields of Eton to the warrens of the poor From Helsinki to Buenos Aires, our reasons are the same From Melbourne to Vancouver now, we have come to Spain For if you sing a song of freedom then, 
It does not matter where If your song is freedom then You sing it everywhere There are some of our number Who've known the pain of war And there are some of our number Who have never fought before But there are none of our number Would think it were in vain to leave their warm blood spilled upon the dry hot soil of Spain. And if I end up on that roll of honour, I'll be in good company. If there's peace beneath the branches of the lime and olive tree. One day there will be no fascist and no anti-fascist men. One day there'll be no us and one day There'll be no them, for equality is for everyone, no matter what we've done. The sins of our fathers will not ever harm our sons, and there will come a great tomorrow for everyone to see. Peace beneath the branches of the lime and olive tree. But if all our dreams are sold and bartered And if all our names are lost And if everything we fought for Crumbles into dust They will never take from me The love I felt that day I went because my open eyes Could see no other way and if I live to be 100, make this my legacy. Peace beneath the branches of the lime and olive tree. Yes, if I live to be 100, make this my legacy. Peace beneath the branches of the lime and olive tree. The Ballad of Johnny Longstaff. That's it. So much to look forward to. That's it for all our performers, Julian, Elizabeth, the young'uns. And go straight to box office. Do not pass go. Do not collect £200. Spend more than £200. Go to the box office and fill your boots. Thank you very much for coming. We'll see you soon. Thank you.